Welcome to part two of the video series entitled Ben Davison Exposed. This is the scientific response to the points made in a 2014 presentation to the Electric Universe Conference by Ben Davidson. In part one, I discussed the errors he made in his discussion of climate and the role of carbon dioxide. In this part, I'm going to deal with the errors and problems that he has talking about the sun as a possible source of global warming. I urge you to watch the video. The link is posted here below in red and take a look for yourself at all the unsupported assertions that he makes. His basic thesis is that carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are not causing global warming, but it is the sun that's heating our planet at the present time. As I have said several times before, Ben is an excellent communicator, and his daily descriptions of what's going on in the sun sound very authoritative. But all he is doing is parroting the outputs from NOAA, NASA, spaceweather.com, solarham.com and other space weather sites. It rapidly becomes clear to me when listening to this video that Ben does not even understand the basics of how the sun works. He makes a series of fundamental scientific errors. He misquotes scientists to make them seem to be supporting his position when in fact they don't. He gives the impression that well-established solar science is in fact still yet a mystery. But then he takes controversial or minority opinions and treats them as gospel. Thus his video takes on more the characteristics of a propaganda piece than that of a scientific lecture. His first unsupported assertion about the sun occurs at 8.30 during the video. He claims that climate models have turned a blind eye to the sun. He provides no proof of that statement. But how can we check? Well, we could go to the definitive review of climate science over the last few years, which is the IPCC, and see how often they mention solar forcing in their reviews. So to get some idea about this, I went to each of the five IPCC reports and searched for the term solar forcing. I did not search for total solar irradiance, sunspot, sun, or any of the other uh, likely terms, just solar forcing. And you can see here in parentheses below the titles how many times they were mentioned. Now the first two did not mention it a great deal, and there's a very good reason for that. In my book, The Many Faces of the Sun, which was published in 1998, the second chapter, called Solar Irradiance Variations, was one of the first comprehensive reviews of changes in the solar output. So the earlier IPCC reports didn't have very much data to go on. However, from the third report on, the subject of solar forcing was discussed quite comprehensively in these reports, including in each one of the model chapters. Thus, Ben's statement that this subject was completely ignored by the models has been shown to be false. Next, Ben starts to discuss the sunspot cycle. He shows this plot and places a line across it at the level of 200. He doesn't explain why 200 has any particular significance. He puts a vertical blue line where he claims that the Earth stopped warming so much. From his plot, I gather that that is in 1992. He then claims that global warming started shortly after the sunspot number reached the 200 for the first time. That would be in 1947. Here I've redrawn Ben's plot. I show the 1947 and 1992 dates with a vertical dotted line. Note, however, I'm using the International Smooth Sunspot Number, not the monthly average sunspot number, which is what Ben used. But I've overplotted the global temperature anomaly in blue. Now you can see from 1947 to 1992, global temperatures only rose by a very small fraction. Indeed, global warming took off after we first reached a value of 200 for the smooth sunspot number. But it was 30 years after, not soon after. So once again, Ben's statement is false. Now this is not the sort of mistake you can make by accident. He had to choose these dates and then deliberately misrepresent the time scale and amount of global warming. So this is a deliberate deception. Ben also keeps on mentioning that there's been a pause in global warming. That is not in fact the case. 
Here I've plotted with a dash line where it's generally recognized that global warming started uh, in the mid 70s. And with vertical bars, I've marked where the 11 hottest years on record are. The top three, 2010, 2005 and 1998 are in red and you'll notice they all occurred during low solar activity. With yellow bars, I've marked the next three hottest years, which includes last year, 2013. And then the last five hottest years are marked in green. All of these hot years have occurred during relatively low solar activity. So once again, Ben's statements are misleading. Next, Ben latches on to the old conspiracy theory that the magnetosphere is weakening and we're all going to die from cosmic ray poisoning. He states that the magnetosphere has weakened by 15% since the mid-1800s. That at least is almost true, but first we must put that in context. He claims the magnetosphere is our shield against space energy, but we have to ask how much energy does it shield? 99.97% of all the energy coming to the Earth comes in the form of light, mostly in the visible part of the spectrum. But the important point is, is that the magnetic field does not affect the flux of light from the Sun. So it's no shield to that at all. If you actually check the literature, it says that the magnetic field strength of the Earth has declined 10 to 15 percent in the last 200 years, not 15 percent in the last 150. So Ben overstated that slightly, but we'll give him a buy on that one. However, if you look at it in context over the last 12,000 years, the Earth's magnetic field currently is still above the long-term average. And if you believe that this trend will continue on downwards, then uh, I suggest you try buying a house in 2006. This is a plot of US house prices from 1992 through to 2008. And as you can see, this long-term upward trend suddenly reversed. It's very dangerous to extrapolate linear trends from data. So how imminent is this threat? Well, if that trend continued, which is unlikely, it'll take 2,000 years before we get to zero. Next, Ben tries to persuade us that the total solar irradiance varies by much more than the 0.1% that everybody usually talks about. He shows this figure, which is a reconstruction based on the sunspot number of the total solar irradiance over the last 400 years. But here again, we catch him overstating the numbers. The reconstruction he showed is a very old one. Much more recent ones show far less variability. But let's take his numbers as the basis and see really how much difference it really makes. He claims by doing this, you'd nearly double the amount of solar variability that we see in the total solar irradiance. However, if you actually look at the numbers that he shows, it only makes 20% difference. What Ben fails to understand is that the sunspot number varies cyclically. In order for it to have an effect on global temperatures, there would have to be a trend. To explain global warming, there would have to be an upward trend. And as you can see from this plot, in the recent years, during the years of global warming that is, the trend, if anything, has been downwards. Ben then implies that the climate scientists and solar physicists all believe that the sun's output is relatively constant. Now, I admit, when I was at college in the early 70s, we did refer to the solar output as the solar constant. It was two calories per square centimeter per second. However, by the early 80s, we were beginning to suspect that the solar constant actually varied, and hence it became called total solar irradiance. By the early 90s, we knew. We had seen one whole solar cycle, and we can conclude that the variation was by 0.1%. So the term solar constant hasn't really been used for over 30 years. But how significant is a 0.1% variation? Let's take a look. Here I've plotted the reconstructed total solar radiance over the last 400 years as a yellow line, but at full scale. You can see it basically looks like a flat line. The inset down in the bottom right is one of the most stable laser oscillators that we can find today. It shows a 0.1% variation over a 40 hour period. The Sun has shown a, uh, almost zero variation over a 400 year period. That to me is pretty constant. 
Ben has a problem here. He seems to think that total solar irradiance means ultraviolet irradiance. He keeps getting the two mixed up. As for example here, he's using the magnesium two wing intensity to indicate that the total solar irradiance is dropping. This particular wavelength represents the ultraviolet intensity, not the total solar irradiance. And even this, if you look at the original data, you'll find that it's made up of a large number of measurements by different instruments that don't agree very well with one another. So you can end up with any particular trend that you like. But you will note that the downward trend starts precisely when global warming starts. This next section I refer to as the fraudulent use of quotes. Here Ben takes quotes by other scientists and either misquotes them or misinterprets them to try to support his case. Let's start with this one. A relatively localized and small amplitude solar influence on the upper and polar atmosphere could have an important effect via nonlinear evolution of atmospheric dynamics on critical processes. Ben translates this as tiny variations on the sun, big changes here on Earth. I have circled the beginning and the end of this sentence for reasons that will become apparent in a second. Here is the original quote. I've marked here in blue the quote that Ben used. I've also marked with the red circles where he put the beginning and end of the sentence. Note that that is not the entire sentence. The first thing is that this is from an open access journal, not a peer reviewed journal. That means you pay money and they'll print whatever you wish with little or no refereeing. In the sentence before the, the one Ben used, they say that this effect is equivalent to the noise in the data. So it's not a big effect at all, and in fact nowhere in the article do they claim that it's big. And note the tentative conclusions in their last paragraph. Our results may, therefore, provide part of the explanation for previously observed correlations. Now I'll remind you that correlations are not proof of an effect, but merely a signal that it's worth continuing to anal analyse the effect. They, in that statement, refer to a paper by Lockwood. If you go to the Lockwood 2010 paper, they specifically say, we stress that this is a regional and seasonal effect relating to European winters, not a global effect. Ben faces another problem here. He quotes a lot of solar physicists. And the problem with that is that I know most of them. So I can call them up or send them an email and ask them, well, did you say that? What did you mean by that? Does your work support the electric universe theory? Does your work support Ben's conclusions? So let's take a look at some examples. Ben starts off by quoting an American Astronomical Society spokesman, Craig DeForest, who happens to be a friend of mine. But note Craig's tentative words. The sun's current maximum activity period is very late and very weak, leading to speculation that the sunspot cycle itself could be shutting down for a bit. That's hardly definitive. However, the American Astronomical Society has been very definitive. They have adopted the American Geophysical Union position on global warming, which states Human caused increases in greenhouse gases are responsible for most of the observed global average surface temperature warming of roughly 0.8 degrees centigrade over the past 140 years. Next, Ben quotes Mike Lockwood. The sun is weakening now faster than any other time in the last 9,000 years. <clears throat> However, in an interview with Ros Piddock, Lockwood states that this is not warning of an imminent ice age and is quoted as saying, a decline in solar activity would have nothing more than a minor effect on global temperatures. In, in saying that, Lockwood is not supporting Ben's position, but completely undermining it. Next, Ben goes on to quote Penn and Livingston. He claims they state that the disappearance of the sunspot cycle for multiple cycles could be on our doorstep. But Penn and Livingston themselves warn it is important to note that it is always risky to extrapolate linear trends, just like I said earlier. They don't mention multiple cycles in their paper or any time scale. They predicted a maximum for solar cycle 24 of no greater than 67, but we're already at 80 and it's likely to increase further over the coming months. So their extrapolation that Ben is relying on is already wrong. Ben supports his point of view by appealing to David Hathaway, who he says 
believes that this is the weakest solar activity in hundreds of years. Now I sent this quote to David Hathaway and I got this response. It's a definite misquote. I've said that this is the weakest cycle in at least a hundred years and I said at least because there are questions about the changes in the way that the sunspot number is calculated that might make the modern numbers inflated. If the modern numbers are inflated then they are no higher than the numbers back in the mid 1800s or mid 1700s when there was a cool period thus breaking the possibility that sunspot number is related to global temperatures. Ben next claims the support of Tony Phillips by saying that the so total solar irradiance varies not by a minuscule 0.1% but by a whopping factor of 10 or more and this can strongly affect the chemistry and thermal structure of the upper atmosphere. If you actually go to the full quote it says within the relatively narrow band of EUV wavelengths so this is of limited applicability again. In that same article Phillips then goes on to quote the work of Charlie Jackman. Now I know Charlie because I play golf with him rel relatively regularly and asked him what he thought of all of this. Here is Charlie's response. The EUV radiation affects the mesosphere and stratosphere but with very minor impact on the troposphere, possibly through the stratospheric ozone changes from EUV. Solar protons cause even a smaller impact on the mesosphere and stratosphere and with virtually no effect on the troposphere. So no support there for Ben's points of view. So what conclusion can we draw from all of this? Large changes on the Sun, virtually no effects on global temperatures. The exact opposite of what Ben originally claimed. Next Ben quotes a paper from Chowdhury and Karak and claiming that they have particular credibility because they predicted this solar cycle so well. Unfortunately in a 2007 paper they predicted the solar maximum would be in 2011 which is utterly wrong. Ben uses the fact that on average there is a more than minimum every 400 years to claim that one is due right now. However, in the Chowdhury and Karak paper that he refers to, it shows that the timing of these things are completely irregular, sometimes being a thousand years between uh, more de minima. So once again, Ben is trying to mislead us by claiming research scientists support his point of view when in fact they aren't. Not one of the scientists I contacted supported the EU theory. None of them said that the sun was the primary cause of global warming. None of them supported the fact that we were going into a maunder minimum imminently and um, none of them supported the idea that we're going into a new ice age. But I think the best quote of all was from Tony Phillips, someone that Ben heaped a lot of praise on, described the electric universe theory as, quote, crackpot. I couldn't agree with him more. I think I've shown successfully here that the solar part of Ben Davidson's talk is full of half-truths, misquotes, deliberate deceptions and scientific errors. I guess the question we have to ask ourselves is why is Ben doing this? He knows better. Several of us have been in contact with him telling him where he's making errors and giving him the uh, tools to check that we are correct. He has chosen to ignore us. Again the question is why? So I would suggest the following course of action. So if you see an instant of Ben talking about climate, please post a link to the part one of my talk. And if you see him talking about the sun being responsible for global warming, please post a link to part two. That way, those that are being taken in by these sorts of argument will have an opportunity to see what the truth is. So until next time, bye for now.